It's early spring here and the spring melt is finally happening and snow is melting very quickly. And today's video, we're going to talk about the thing, not the only thing, but one of the only things that you just can't live without, water. So in the last number of videos, we've looked at a framework that I've been demonstrating to you about how I evaluate land on whether a homestead property is valuable or not. And we're going through now, we're going through the scales of permanence that is based on PA Yeoman's scales of permanence on a, a framework on which you can analyze a property. And today we're gonna to talk about water. And we're gonna to jump to some clips from the course. And in this video, I'm gonna show you a handful of examples of properties that have really bad situations for water. So water is the thing that you need to live and to grow food. So it's incredibly important when you are looking for a piece of property and it's in the top four, say, things that um, you can do very little about. You can do things about them, but at what cost? And that always comes down to the question. So these next properties here, we're gonna look at situations that you don't wanna get into in regards to water. Before we jump into this next batch of properties, I just want to note that I'm using Google Earth Pro here, and we're going to do a top-down analysis of six properties, three that are fails for water and three that are wins for water. And this is the kind of information that is in my online course, Finding the Perfect Homestead Property. In fact, I go through 50 in-depth analysis of properties all over North America, similar to this, but up to 20 minutes to 30 minutes long. So enjoy these ones. This is Rattlesnake, Wyoming, and uh, it's an example of a total failure for water. You wouldn't want to get yourself into a kind of situation. So this is a, um, a BSK climate uh, in, a, in a more northern region, Wyoming. It's cold, it's harsh, it's dry. Um, there's a house here, the house is, is old and, and it's a really cool timber frame, uh, orientated to the northeast for God knows what reason. But um, there is a well on property. Uh, they didn't have any details about it, which makes me suspicious. Um, also, this place gets very little rain, 17 inches of rain a year, does get a lot of snow. So the potential to capture snow is somewhat there, but the geography just isn't that great because you can't capture that much um, and a significant effort to do so. Just huge amounts of earthworks. There's no natural draws that are really easy to see. You can see that there is always some kind of something in the topography and often roads will follow those draws. There's capture points in some ways, but it's just, it's a step BSK climate, so it's not going to get um, a huge amount of snow. It will get it, but um, the topography is just not that well set up to capture. So well, there's no trees or vegetation on this property at all. So you can't benefit from, from that either because the snow will just melt really quickly here uh, and it'll run off fast. And so just not a good scenario for water. It's a property here in uh, Newberry Springs, California, and just a really tough situation for water. So there's a well here on site, and uh, it's tapped into an aquifer that you can see. Uh, there's a number of uh, groups taking advantage of, which are completely unsustainable in so many different ways. Now, if these wells were tapped into primary water, uh, if you don't know what that is, you could look it up. But uh, I would say, okay, maybe, but they're not. The California hasn't drilled any real primary water wells. And this is tapped into an aquifer. This is just not sustainable. The type of agriculture that's happening in this area consumes so much water and the soil is dust, basically. Uh, but they make it work with a lot of water, a ton of water and a ton of fertilizer. Uh, and then you've got these subdivided communities here that have this artificial lake. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Um, so yes, water, at what expense though? I believe California now meters well water. So um, there's just, it's just a place that 
there isn't naturally any rainfall. I mean, five to 12 inches of rain a year, which is ridiculously low. And if you just look at the landscape around, this is like living on Mars. So not a, a situation for water that is in, inducive to homesteading and, and growing lots of crops, uh, doing regenerative agriculture, just not uh, conducive to that. You can really fake it like the neighbor is and spend an insane amount of water spend an uh, insane amount of money on water to maintain something that is just not naturally going to happen without uh, ridiculous amounts of irrigation. This just doesn't exist. So it's not the kind of situation I would want to get myself into. This is 26 acres in Castleton, Ontario. It's a zone six and it's a, it's a, it's a good example of a bad situation for water, but it's not your typical situation where the water getting the water is the issue. This is where there's too much water and it's become a liability. So this property had some weird things done to it that involved drainage from other properties. And in this, in this exact case, we had these fields of conventionally grown crops that are rototilled and fertilized and irrigated uh, at a you know conventional agricultural standard. And every year during the precipitational sh precipitation runoff winter or in the fall after they rototill the fields which is ridiculous this soil all drains down into this draw that comes along here crosses this road through a culvert and basically floods this property now this could have been managed uh better to start if this if they would have just drained this because what it does is it follows along here they could have just bypassed it because of the water and you can see it's kind of algae based it's because it's all the nitrogen fertilizers from all these fields that runs off there's a draw that goes along here and, and it just naturally drains down this way and then collects into these larger tributaries but uh, this property is essentially a swamp as a result of this and it they didn't it, this could have been avoided at some point they could have just drained this water through here but it's flooded out uh, and that wouldn't be a bad thing if you weren't upstream from conventional farms using conventional nitrogen-based fertilizers. Uh, now you just got this gross situation where you have this swamp on this property and they're selling, you know, 26, whatever it is here, it's highlighted here, um, 26 acres, but really you only have a smaller ax, a smaller bit of it. And it's also all on a major road, not that major, but it's on a road. So they're trying to sell you 26 acres, but all you're getting is nine and the houses are even rotted out. So the property is just a total nightmare, but it's an example of how uh, water can also be a huge liability to you for things that are external threats outside of your property boundary. In this next group of videos, we're gonna look at good situations for water and the type of things that you would be looking for if you're looking for the perfect homestead property. This property is 40 acres in Kettle Falls, Washington, and it's a, a fantastic example of good water under the circumstances. So this climate um, gets about 40 inches of snow um, in the winter, for 48 inches of snow in the winter, um, which is a decent amount of snow, but not a lot. And um, if in our climate classification here, you can just see how it stacks up compared to many parts of Canada and the rest of Washington. It gets into this DSB climate, which is just a little bit warmer of a boreal climate with a little bit more precipitation in the summer and a little less in the winter. So a little less snow in the winter, but more rain in the growing season, which is really nice. And it, probably why you can, you have lakes up at this high, higher elevation here, far above this main uh, river coming through because it gets a decent amount of collective snow melt and rain runoff. But uh, this property was 40 acres. It had a well installed, actually beautiful house. It's a total win. One of our high, might have been our highest rated property um, and uh, great growing area. But on top of the well that it's already has, that they're obviously using for irrigation of this little half acre garden and such, um, you could capture so much snow melt and rain runoff down here and create a pond in this area here. You can kind of see this sheds out this way and this obviously sheds down here and the whole thing kind of slopes down 
to this low point here. So you could essentially, with very little earthworks, funnel all the snow melt in one direction to be collected here, uh, and and the rain would inevitably do the same thing. So you could, I calculated that you could harvest about seven million liters of water on this property. Basically, I just took the square feet, the total square feet, and uh, I, I uh, and just compared it to what I get. I get 90 inches, and it turns out to be about nine liters uh, per square foot here they've got uh, about the same square footage but about half the snow so it turns out to be uh, 6.9 million liters of potential water that you capture just from snow melt alone uh, if you divide that by say the amount of growing days so divided by 200 that gives us an available 34,000 liters of water per day for our entire growing season that's more than adequate to do everything with new trees food forests pastures you name it so this property is just a such a fantastic example of a good water situation even based in its context as being somewhat high elevation at 700 meters uh, times that by three for feet uh, in elevation this is 45 acres in Carleton Mississippi and it's a really good example of just a fantastic situation for water so they get a lot of rain here 70 inches a year not really any snow and um, Water can also be a burden in uh, really rainy places, especially if you don't have any topography and your place can potentially be flooded out and there isn't sort of a path of least resistance for things to drain. Well, on this property, it's got that. In fact, it's also got a pond, which is great and, and, and connects to the neighbor's property a little bit. But there's a good amount of topography here and you can just see that the build site is is high enough off this pond that it's never going to be an issue this pond would also drain down this way too it kind of follows a little valley so it'll never be a, a, a significant liability to you but they've got this smaller pond here and that's a great source of water that pond itself is is quite a significant size here so call it to what's in your property is to a two acre size, so that's, that's great. A ton of water uh, capture here and here that could be distributed with the irrigation throughout the property, no problem, up into this other field. And uh, yeah, just a great situation for water. This is just under 13 acres in Anton Chico, New Mexico. And it's a this is a tough climate for water in general. However, this property is really neat. The way there's two water features that go through it and um, it's an incredible source of water. So the property itself had a well connected to it and, and there's well water for the, the houses, but there's this little slow moving tributary that goes through it around the property. And then there's a sub runoff that was, has been created, sort of a riparian area, if you will, that comes through. And, and the, the really neat opportunity on this property is that it's sort of a chicken and egg thing when it comes to water and vegetation and wildlife and geography and kind of how all those things intersect to uh, create benefits for you. But you could just imagine if you wanted to, I mean, you could irrigate these fields and that's obviously what he's done. You can see that he's run machinery through, down, through here probably to cut hay or something, but he's been able to irrigate this place and um, to do it in a sort of a permaculture way, a really uh, a way to establish more trees if you wanted to, would be to create following um, contour lines coming off this area to cut some sort of swale feature or a spillway off this into the land and then start planting trees off there to branch trees further and further off this uh, not necessarily zigzagging, but um, greening this property even more. It's so neat because it's really so well situated that you could turn it into a little oasis. And it already has the the beginnings of that happening. But uh, this is a climate that I normally don't like. Like I wouldn't want to live, I think this is a BSK. Um, uh, I wouldn't want to live in a BSK. It's It's tough, it's arid, it's harsh. Your lips get chapped, <laughs> at least they do for me. Um, but you can create these microclimates. Yeah, this is a BSK if we go into our Copenhagen 
map and look at the regions of North America, that's the, the region that we're in here is a BSK. And it's tough existence, but it can actually be really neat if you have the benefits of geography in a way that led this through this property. Um, and uh, it was probably this feature might have been built at an earlier date when this was a, perhaps a bigger property that was subdivided down. Um, but you can really enjoy this climate because it's sunny uh, and it's warm, but it can be cool at night. Uh, and it can sometimes be uncomfortably hot in the summer if you don't have shade, but you do have shade and you have this beautiful retreat that, you, that really adds to the aesthetics and experience of the property as well. So if you guys liked that kind of content and you're interested in more about this course that I've created, head over to homestead.freedomfarmers.com. There's a waiting list there. Just put your email address in and very shortly we'll send you some more information about the course, early bird pricing and the release date. Look forward to seeing you in there. Take care. In my masterclass, I'll teach you a framework that you can apply to any property anywhere. You'll be able to quickly spot threats, red flags, uncover opportunities and discover strengths. I then apply this framework to over 50 properties all over North America in all different types of climates. You can watch me in real time review properties of all different sizes, prices and stages of development. This will completely change how you find properties. You'll be faster, you'll be more confident and you'll waste less time.